Dr. Phil Malika, a graduate of the University of Medicine and Dentistry. Hey, hey. Rutgers now. Yes, Rutgers. Rutgers. Uh, prior to dental school, though, he received a master's degree at, in human anatomy at Farley Dickinson University. He's an author, researcher, speaker, and currently on our board of directors. He's the chair of the Periodontal Therapy Committee and has received mastership in the academy. And he's going to seem like a really nice guy. He's funny and all that. But growing up with him as his son was torture. And I'm just telling you, he's, he ain't that nice. Without further ado, Phil Malika. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is everybody still awake? All right. A lot of familiar faces out there. And it's a uh, pleasure being in uh, Vermont, of all places. I'm glad everyone found this place. It was pretty awesome. We, uh, we drove up from uh, Jersey yesterday and uh, visited quite a few friends on the way up, so it was a long trek. So let's talk a little bit different now. You know, you heard the mercury issue. You're all dead and dying. Uh, you heard the fluoride issue. You can't drink the damn water. Uh, can't eat the damn food, but eat it anyhow because it tastes so good, okay? So, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, before we hop into the perio, uh, I've been doing a lot of research in, uh, in water, in water and uh, of course the, the physics, the biophysics of ozonating water because that's a real important aspect, especially in your dental units, uh, even periodontal treatment. And we're going to talk about ozone uh, halfway through, I guess, after our break somewhere along the line. But I was invited to speak, uh, I spoke in Berlin about the concept of ozonating water because I was curious. I mean. You ozonate water, okay, in a column, et cetera, et cetera. How the hell does ozone get entrapped in water? And I'm like, I don't understand that. How does carbonation get trapped in a water molecule? So I did, you know, investigations on that, looked at the physics of it, understand that water is an incredible molecule, extremely simple, but yet so complex. When you think we take water for granted, you know, how much percentage are you of water? Okay, what, 70, 80 percent, you know, unless you're dehydrated and flying in an airplane or whatever. Well, around the world, you know, we see water in the ocean. Uh, we drink water, you know, hopefully clean water, which I'll talk about in a second. We look at the clouds. How the hell does an ice cube float in its own stuff? Think about it. We don't take it for granted. What the hell? It's frozen water. Why does it float on water? How does a cloud form? And why does a cloud stay there? Well, it's like kind of interesting things. Well, I spoke in Berlin, and I was invited to the, uh, this International Ozone Association in Washington, D.C. These are all the water guys, okay? All the guys that treat your water that you drink out of the tap or you don't drink out of the tap. So I was curious. It was wonderful. I presented some of the ozone things we do biologically, treating wounds, periodontal disease, uh, you know, all different type of issues, extractions, etc. They invited me on their board. Oh, great, another job, right? So I was curious about water because you got to, you know, you drink a tap of water and you open it up, drink it. It's, God, man, it's so much chlorine in here. What the hell is that all about? And all I heard that whole weekend was how they ozonate the water. Ozonate, ozonate the water. And then sometimes you drink tap water, you don't taste chlorine at all. And I'm like, okay, great. So I became friends with the president of the organization, Eric Wirt, who runs all the water supply throughout Nevada. He's a research scientist that runs all that. I says, Eric, I don't understand how you drink wonderful water. He says, oh, the water is fantastic. I says, okay, you ozonate the water at the source. Absolutely, absolutely. I says, well, that cleans it. It's amazing. We're able you know, measure things. I learned how to measure ozone concentration, water, all this cool stuff. I said, why the hell is it you're dumping chlorine, of all things, and we know chlorine is what? Pretty strong oxidizing toxic agents, right up there at fluoride. He says, well, the problem is, is that keeping the water clean in the distribution end of it. Okay, now they have nice, clean, almost sterile water at the source, but once it goes out into those pipelines, this is where we get our dose of chlorine. And he says, well, the further you're away, Okay, the further away, the less chlorine you will taste. I says, oh, that's not bad. He says, well, we'll kill you anyhow. I said, what the hell are you? He says, well, remember, as the chlorines go along, become oxidized, become what? Trihalomethanes. And what are trihalomethanes? 
carcinogenic. It says, Phil, make sure you have filtration system on your water. That's the tip of the day. Filter your water, please. Okay? Filter your water. If they taste chlorine, it's good for you. Clean your right out. Get those microbiology working in your gut very well. So anyhow, so our job or my job today is kind of talk about perio in a biologic sense. Okay? So as part of our my committee, you know, we get together, we discuss periodontal issues, what's going on, latest type of treatments that are out there. And we really talk about soft tissue management also. And so that really is our methodology right there. I think I'm gonna have to stay on the stage or can I walk around? I hear no comment, I can walk around. Oh, okay, all right. That's good. I like talking to my friends, plus I also like to see what the hell I'm putting on the slides. So here's our mission, you know, the Periodontal Associated Soft Tissue Committee. We do all kinds of stuff. We promote support practitioners, current emerging biologic therapies. Have we talked about biologic dentistry? Who's a biologic dentist here, by the way? Oh, trying to be? Oh, awesome. You've run the right place because this is, our academy is one of the most giving in, you know, groups I've ever seen. They're always welcoming and you can always talk to any member here and you get all the support you really need. So anyhow, so our committee gets together, talks about perio. Now you think that puts you right to sleep, but it's very exciting. It's like the foundation of a house, okay? We love the foundation of the house. And this is where periodontal care comes in. And it really transcends that in many ways. So our goals, what are our goals today? Let's see, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to present the official position of the IMT, reference to periodontal care. And then we're going to have some fun because then we're going to talk about biologic therapies. Thinking biologically. And that's the shift that you make. If you want to enter the biologic dental world, which is really now and the future, you have to think differently. That's the key. Thinking biologically. Once you start thinking biologically, your whole world shifts and your practice changes and then all the woo-woos of the world come flooding into your office. Trust me. Tachyon beads, aluminum hats, you know, uh, you know dousing rods. It's awesome, man. And you look out the window of my office. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's time to come in. Well, the astrological signs are correct today at 12.01 to have my tooth extracted. So I'm sitting there like this. My elevator, you may proceed now. <laughs> Did we make it? Yes, Mars passed perfectly. Thank you. Uh, come into our world, you'll love it, okay? But they do pay very well. They do pay, they don't give a crap about insurance, which is awesome. <laughs> All right. So anyhow, let me go back one quick slide. So of course you can get the sense we're getting out of the box here. And I, for some reason, me and my dear wife right over there, we've been practicing together for uh, 36 years. And uh, we, you know, we were talking about this on the way up. Have we ever been in the box? Always kind of looking at the different world in a different way, which is fun. Makes it different because just drilling holes in people's heads. That didn't do it for me, believe me. So we're going to think in an integrative biologic manner. I love the term integrative because it brings, opens up your world. You don't become block and locked into a particular model. You're open to all things because patients, guess what? Need different things. Need different things. And you're open in that particular model itself. So we're going to see, you know, let's see the forest from the trees. And of course, you know, we do love the trees and that will all make sense in a few moments. So let's talk about, I guess, biocompatible disease control, the official recommendations of the IOMT. Official, very official, which right up my alley. So anyhow, we go back in history. We're all familiar history. This is our Typical <clears throat> biologic patient, this patient here on the left will eat nothing but organic food, free range, grass fed, cage free, and it's really worked out except you gotta brush your teeth once in a while and see your dentist. So going back over the last 120 years, it's been a, kind of an evolution. I mean, what the hell's causing, you know, periodontal loss? Meaning that the supporting structure, the periodontal ligaments, uh, the supporting bone structures, what creates all the bloody, funky, nasty looking looking uh, teeth and, and gums, etc. And what makes them come in? That they're fermenting. If you everybody have patients that come in, you know they're fermenting, okay? You know it right away. 
Whew. So kind of going back, you know, we had uh, Dr. Willoughby D. Miller and uh, work with, you know, famous Dr. Robert Koch, and they had the chemoparasitic theory of, you know, uh, caries, you know. Caries, you know, both caries and prenatal disease were caused by bacteria, period. You know, it's almost like the Pasteur concept. Everything was the bacteria, right? And to Bonchamp, say what? It's the terrain. It's the terrain. So, let's see if this slide works. Beautiful. 1920, just a couple of years ago, the bacteria theory abandoned because scientists couldn't detect any bacterial difference between health and pyorrhea. Remember the term? I don't know if any new dentists even hear that term. Pyorrhea. Pam, you know that one, right? I'll have pyorrhea. That used to be popular on TV commercials. If you want to avoid pyorrhea, okay. Now it's periodontal disease. Thank you. Okay, so gum disease, okay? So they thought it was make, you know, bacteria, and then of course they couldn't really identify it exactly as bacteria. You know, it could have been, you know, overhangs. God forbid you have an overhang filling, okay? God forbid you have an open margin, that will destroy everything, okay? And some patients have all kinds of crappy dentistry and their teeth and gums are fine. It's amazing, what the hell is that all about, okay? So, you know, it's a matter of just some kind of irritating factor that creates this bone loss and nasty looking gums itself, okay? So, you know, tartar and cavities cause pyorrhea, okay? So then we did microbiological testing in the 60s and really saw no difference in the bacteria. You know, one little quick note. Do you know that we really only understand 1% of the microbiological world, okay? We only understand 1% of what grows out there. And now there's something called dark matter, which we'll talk a little bit about. Dark matter in the biologic or in the microbiologic world, which are bacteria that are on top of the bacteria, that grow on the bacteria. What the hell is that all about? Gee, it's amazing what we're learning, okay? So, you know, once again, we're seeing the difference between bacteria and health and disease. I mean, you know, in other words, we don't know what the hell's causing it, okay? No, you know, the nonspecific, a uh, plaque theory, meaning we don't know what it is, okay? Non-specific plaque theory, okay? So then we get back into, you know, the 1979, that only specific bacteria are pathogenic. Nonsense, nonsense, we know much differently today, okay? Do you know that bacteria versus mammalian cells, first of all, and we're gonna probably hit on this again, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but remember, 90% of you is what? Wrong bacteria. Only 10% is what you think is you. So we've been trying to kill 90% of ourselves for how many years? Okay, and we're seeing the results of that today. Versus nurturing that 90%. Remember, those bacteria that are on your skin and your lungs, they find it in nerve in your brain, central nervous system, they all have a significant role. Digestion, metabolism. I mean, I'm gonna talk about tomorrow, but you know, if your gut's not working right, you're not happy. You ever get a stomach ache? Oh man, I'm, I'm in a bad mood. I'm in a bad mood. You know, where's Lou Travato? I know he was drinking heavily last night. Oh, that's right, Barb, he's, he's missing already. He's in the bathroom right now because his microflora got disrupted. Okay, your microflora disrupted in your gut. Guess what? You're not gonna produce what? Serotonin. And serotonin is what? Oh, the happy drug. Happy drug makes you happy, makes your sex drive up. Sorry. Yeah, I'm looking at my friend back there from Atlanta. Now, I know what you're thinking about. I'll help you with your serotonin later. Anyhow, so the specific plaque hypothesis, okay? So specific plaque, uh, specific bacteria cause gum disease. But then we started to think immunologically. It's an environmental issue, possibly. But also, is it immun you know, immunologic issue in the sense that our immune system is doing stupid things. Doing stupid things and really creating the damage itself, okay? So the immunologic concept here is that the system gets hijacked, and we're gonna talk about that because the system does get hijacked, and this is where the destruction really comes in, okay? Let's see if we can get past this here. There we go. Whoa. 
historical theories continue. So to prevalence. How do you measure prevalence of periodontal disease? I mean, everybody goes through cycles of periodontal disease. I mean, I'm not even sure what periodontal disease really means. I mean, the typical thing is about, you know, X amount of millimeter pocketing, et cetera. And we'll discuss that in a few minutes, but the prevalence of that. So, you know, we know that periodontal disease is communicable. We love to share our periodontal disease, but is it really a contagion? What we're sharing is our microflora itself. So, of course, we start screwing our kids up right away. Look at my son, Griffin Cole, okay? For example, he had too much bacteria in his head right there, but we transfer it to our kids. And even, listen, when, chi when a child is born, it's critical how they're born. You know, their microflora is totally different from a vaginal birth versus a cesarean birth, okay? So it's really the microflora which is critical. Ch children are born sterile. We have to get good microflora in there. So we know that there is transmissibility of that. And there's a test called BANA, which I'll go over briefly, which is kind of an assessment tool, an assessment tool to show the levels of certain type of bacteria itself. So of course, we're gonna infect our kids, and then, you know, this study has shown 35 times or 54 times more prevalence itself. And of course, oral cavity, we know, is sterile at birth. And then of course, welcome to the world of microflora itself. And once again, periodontal disease is communicable itself. There we go. And the transmission is saliva. Everybody loves spit, right? It's a beautiful thing. So, of course, bacterial exchange during intimate kissing. Okay. So 80 million microbes are transferred during a 10 second, you know, French kiss with the zombie population. Okay, this is the walking dead sucking face. I guess things never give up at a certain period of time. We're still horny and we're dead. D in New Jersey, we see dead. You're dead. What? D-E-D, -E you're dead. Okay. So anyhow, so think about it tonight. If you suck in face, about 80 million uh, microbes are transferred. You get a 10-second kiss and that you're done. Oh, God. Life's rough. Anyhow. So, but with that transfer, I mean, some, you know, bacteria can come and go, like anything, but, you know, they have to attach, there's a whole process to that. And, you know, some will find a, you know, a nice little, you know, quiet niche in your tongue or, you know, the tissue itself and hang out for a while. It's a nice thing. So, I mean, you know, it's pretty cool. But it was always interesting. A friend of mine years ago, he says, you know, you get periodontal disease from wives, lovers, and dogs. And I'm like, okay, John, what have you been up to lately? But finally, through a friend of mine, we found what that whole dog thing was about, okay? This mysterious parallel disease in two kids in Sweden, okay, from Ditton cities, the source of the infection, very similar infections. Well, as it turned out, theoretically, okay, all the families were tested, nobody else had it except these kids. So they took these plaque samples, analyzed it over a year period, and it was only the family dogs had that type of bacteria. I guess his serotonin levels were up. So he was sucking face with the dog. You know, kids stop. My pit bull had a propensity for sticking its tongue in your face. Uh, but I guess so. Once again, it was really that identical strain. Those were the same puppies that uh, the two kids had, and they were infected from that uh, situation itself with the dog. Don't suck face with that, that's a Darla during our Easter time. She's our Easter bulldog. Only a face a mother could love. Anyhow, so don't suck face with dogs in other words. Okay, so, you know, they do these studies trying to figure out the prevalence of periodontal disease, but it's really a, like a dynamic. How do you measure that? How many people have that? I mean, doing a study, 65 million people, over half of them had periodontal disease. And that was really just based on, really, you know, the amount of bone loss, of course, pocket depth, that type of typical stuff. And if there's a little inflammation, that can give you some, you know, some very false readings itself. So, you know, two to five millimeter pockets. And, of course, a substantial number of the population has periodontal disease, okay? And, uh, of course, you know, the interesting thing I've learned over 36 years of practice is that the interesting thing about this periodontal disease thing is that the problem is a lot of patients, what? They don't feel it. 
okay? When did he feel periodontal disease? <laughs> when the teeth were moving and they're abscessing. Then they come in, I didn't feel anything. I woke up this morning, all my teeth are loose. You woke up this morning and all your teeth are loose. Or don't you like when a patient comes in, new patient, how you doing, this and that, okay, I'm holistic, I'm this and that, okay, fantastic. And they open their mouth and there's like root tips just stuck in the gum. What? Did, did that hurt? I, have, I never felt anything. What the hell, are you kidding me? <laughs> root tips and stuck in this and that. Now how do you chill like this? Well, I got two teeth over here. Oh, great. I feel like I'm with my uh, friend from Kentucky. Anyhow. So, education the patients, absolutely. You, you, you educate them, you know, saying how important it is. Uh, my dear wife handles all the soft tissue, all the perio things. She does the mommy stuff. You should see the guys in her dental chair if they're not doing their homework. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right here. Oh, she'll give them the mommy special. Ooh, it's ugly in there. I said, I'm sending you back the carrot. <gasps> no, no. Okay. But education, now you listen, you know what? It's like any kind of house. If you have a lousy foundation, the damn house is going to fall off. So how do we, you know, maintain that sound foundation? We could build anything on teeth, it appears, okay? So, and of course, once again, a belief system, okay? Belief system that, you know, a good oral health is important to longevity and health, which it really is, because we know... You'll hear Tom, you know, one of our faculty members, uh, Tom Levy, talking about, you know, stealthy infections in jaws and stuff. That stuff wears you down, man. Wears you down. Okay. Of course, you know, believing, oh, I believe in hygiene, believe in seeing my dentist, and they don't show up for two years. And they come with all kinds of problems itself. Okay. There we go. And once again, the value of patient education. You know, and listen, it's kind of an interesting thing also when you think about it. Let's say you have a periodontal patient. Okay, they've got periodontal issues. You get them in, do all the examination, do all beautiful restoration, get rid of the mercury, clean everything up, get the periodontal care under, under control, meticulous, beautiful, and you release them. Okay? Or you do beautiful prosthetics. Everybody loves prosthetics, okay? When you think about it, let's say the patient's coming in once every three months. For what? Maybe an hour? You give a hygienist an hour, so they do hygiene for half an hour and goof around for half an hour. Okay, am I right? I'd say, what do you do for an hour? Uh, I don't know. Anyhow, so you got them in there for an hour. It's four hours out of the entire year. If these people don't do their damn homework and keep their mouth clean, they come back and what happened? Everything failed. How do we control the other hours that they're away from us? We only get them for four hours to clean them up. And I'm kind of thinking, gee, that's a lot of time that these people are, are on their own. And once again, trying to educate them. I always tell them, they come in, oh, I want this beautiful bridge. I want these implants. And stuff. That's great. You can invest all kinds of money. But if you don't take care of it like fine jewelry, keep it clean. And I'll tell you why, okay? It's going to be nothing. It's going to completely fail. And guess whose fault it is? The dentist. The dentist did this. Okay? Not that they didn't take care of their stuff. The dentist did it. Okay? So education is critical. And once again, we're all infected. We're all infected. But once again, there's a difference in infection. If you're healthy and you're feeling good, all right, things are working fine, you are well colonized. The bacteria are fine, all those kind of weirdo things going there, humming along, you're well colonized. When your environment and your ecology shifts, because you're an, e you're an ecosystem, when your ecosystem starts to shift, you become tend to become more acidic, you're not digesting properly, your guts are off, you start, there are certain bacteria or whatever will start to emerge, okay? This is when you become infected. When you come out of the colonized state, into a bacterial imbalance, and that's infection, and they start to dominate, okay? It's an ecological issue. So you wanna be well colonized, and that's what probiotics are about in maintaining good hygiene. So etiology, you know, you got a pathogenic flora, whatever that really might mean, okay? Susceptible host, that's for sure. 
nice environment to set up camp in, okay? And, you know, 75% 70, 70, 70, of disease prevalence is, you know, by genetic mutation, and that's important to understand. Bacteria can switch genes on and off super quick. Mammal cells have a really hard time shifting genes around. We get damaged genes over time. But, once again, as the environment changes, so does the microflora because they have that capability. It's called pleomorphism. It's work of Dr. Enderline years ago. That's why all of a sudden, you know, you have someone, where the hell did they get spirochetes from, which I'll show you. Where did that come from? You know, where did these things have you developed from? I didn't have those, you know, three months ago. I haven't brushed my teeth for three months, but where the hell did they come from? I caught them in the air, you know, sucking face with a dog or something. Okay? These things have the capability of morphing themselves based on the environment they live in. Okay? That's for sure. So, once again, you know, that possibly is unlikely. It's an you know, obliging host that sets up the proper environment, and the real damage comes when our body tries to defend it, but also it does get hijacked, which we'll talk about that in a bit. So, you get an immune response, that's where all the damage occurs, that's for sure, and this is where we wind up with the connective tissue and bone loss. Not so much the bugs themselves, but it's our response to that infective state that creates a lot of the damage that we perceive today and allows for a lot of the things which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So, you know, health versus periodontal disease. Health, we have gram positive, it's aerobic, tend to be more oxygenated. We don't see an immune response, which means white blood cells. There's none of those spirochetes, okay? And it's really, you know, it's a biofilm, which we'll talk about in a second. But, you know, it's really just laying around very nice. Because remember, all the bugs, they just don't hang out. They all live in biofilm, which we'll talk about. So it's very quiescent. It's very oxygenated. And this is the key, which we'll talk about. How do you maintain your oral cavity properly? Versus the disease state, okay, the difference are really with disease, you know, the gram, gram negative and anaerobic. We see many white blood cells, neutrophils pouring into the area, many spirochetes, and it's highly motile. This is an environmental, ecological shift. Okay, this is where, once again, this biofilm is laying around too long. Okay, the food supply is changing, but more importantly, the oxygenation of the area is dramatically dropping. The partial pressure of the oxygen is dropping as the ecology changes, becomes more acidic, more toxic, and the bugs are adapting to that environment. It's all about ecology, ecology, ecology. So, let's see, predominantly, you know, healthy, th you know, we find these types. Probably, this is probably like one millionth of what you grow. But this is what they typically find in a healthy microflora, these different type of bugs, okay? Because they can measure them. Once they go in any kind of microbiology, the only way you know it, if you take a sample and you can grow it and identify it. But believe me, by the time you go down and take that sample out of that cravicular fluid and put it onto an agar tray or whatever growth medium you want, you probably lost 99% of it. So we don't know. Is it important to know? Maybe to some degree, they're doing DNA testing and stuff, but that's even extremely flawed. That's why we only know maybe 1% of actually the bacteria that we grow. And no white blood cells, of course. And then we get into the more pathogenic end, gram negatives, and that's really just a staining methodology. And this is Saransky's red group, which you see on the DNA testing, okay? So you'll see different types of changes there. You see the spirochetes, trypomonas, and parasitic forms as the environment changes itself into more pathogenic. But once again, this is assessment. This is a sense of it. Okay, this is a sense of what this is all about. Okay. And remember fungus. There's fungus amongst us. Remember, you have everything. Okay, it's just a matter of what's dominating. What's the biggest problem? I don't want to get off track. What's the biggest problem we find in root canals? Is a fungal infection, okay? Amongst other things, okay? Just keep 
that in mind, but that's for another discussion unto itself. And we see inflammation in there. So what about bacteria biofilms itself? Okay, well, it wasn't last night's pizza or veggie burgers. I tried to eat a veggie burger last night, very good. Okay, trying to stay somewhat healthy. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyhow, well, last night's pizza, mucus, microbe, you know, it used to be called plaque. Remember the first day of dental school, you go in there, we're gonna stain your teeth with the red dye. They still do that? Yeah, probably, okay. Okay, that's not necessarily biofilm, but just kind of foody goop hanging around the teeth themselves. Biofilm is really where things live, okay? This is the correct term now. We don't use all plaque anymore, we call it biofilm, okay? And really, what are biofilms all about? Well, you get the nice growth of bacteria. Let's see, we get this working right. Oh, there we go. When the bugs get together, they don't not live and just hang out in the air. They create biofilm themselves. They start connecting with each other. They love each other. They are very well organized together. And they start producing mucus. They pull it out, what's called the extracellular matrix, which we'll talk about after the break. And the oxygen starts to drop down. They're living in this beautiful environment. They have streets, they have high rises, they have condos, they're well organized groups, okay? But that eventually works against us. So when you have a happy little ecosystem in and around your gums itself, you don't really have too many what they call pathogens at that particular point. But what's happened, the, the neighborhood starts to get too crowded. You know, too many of the guys hanging around. I can't stand it. I'm, I feel like I'm living in Manhattan over here. The people are all over me. These, these guys are crowding me. Food's becoming problematic, okay? You know, we have to, you know, get, start to get certain critical mass. We've got to do something about it, okay? So, you know, bacteria, you know, start to recognize that, you know, there's too many of them around. So they start producing toxins. They start trying to poison their pals, okay? They start gathering millions of them packing together. I can't take it anymore. I'm too crowded. I'm going to start producing, producing toxins himself. Okay. And this is through doing what's called quorum sensing. They actually talk to each other. The interesting thing about bacteria, this microflora, is that they all speak the same language. And that's the language of chemicals. Cytokines. We call it cytokinese they speak. So they're all speaking the same language and they're all gathering up. And what will happen is, is that they'll actually start producing these toxins. These toxins will induce an immune response. And the interesting thing about this immune response is that as the neutrophils come in, the phagocytes, all this, macrophages all come flooding into the area in response, what happens, these toxins actually poison the neutrophils. So they start, they do kill the bugs, but they go through apoptosis much too early and release tons of enzymes out there, digestive type enzymes, that actually break down the epithelial lining of the periodontal pocket. This is where this allows for infiltration of these, these pathogenic forms into the tissue itself. It's incredible that they get the, uh, the immune system to work for themselves by hijacking it through toxins. Because remember, we love the epithelial cell, which we'll talk about in a little while, but epithelial cells are amazing. They protect us like barriers. But once these barriers are broken through these toxins produced by the neutrophils, our cells, okay, it's almost like autoimmunity disease destroying our cells. This is allows for infiltration of all the little parasitic forms and the bugs themselves. So, so now you have a toxic mature biofilm, okay? So hijacks immune system, attacks competitive microbes, polymorphs are poison, okay, as they change, okay, early apoptosis occurs, getting those enzymes released, breaking down those epithelial bears, and once again, allows for that infiltration of those bugs into the tissue itself. Hey, listen, you know what? Hey, everybody go in and hide out. And this is the problem when you're dealing with type of parasitic forms like amoeba, trichomonas, these type of things, they actually crawl into the tissue and hide out if you're treating them chemically, because they can smell the chemicals. Once they smell the chemicals, they go hide out. It's like treating if you have a fungal infection. You know, your body generally has fungal infection. You do an antifungal agent. 
You knock down the fungus. Oh, wow, my fungus is all gone. And a few weeks later, they all come back. They're not stupid. They're not stupid things. They hide out. Mm, coast is clear. All right, everybody come out. All righty. Beautiful. Okay. So with biofilm, once again, it's extremely well organized. They all speak the same language. They can reform very quickly. They're using our own natural proteins and albumins, et cetera, that build this beautiful structure they live in. And a bacteria has been shown again and again is a thousand times or more resistant to any kind of antibacterial you know, to therapy if it lives in a biofilm. So the trick now is, is that you have a therapeutic agent that has to be, once in, once, first of all, break through a biofilm, okay? And once it gets through the biofilm, dissolve the biofilm and get to those bacterial forms below that and what else ever lives there itself. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've been waiting for, biofilm forming through the uh, University of Montana work. So this is over a number of hour period, about 16 hours itself, how it becomes organized itself. How are we doing on time-wise on the hour break? We're still good? You're all mesmerized right now? <laughs> this is me. Get a drink of water. All this information, all the things I'm talking about, are going to boil down to a very simple thing at the end. Extremely simple remedy for all these problems. But you see now, as things move on, the partial pressure, oxygen, the environment changing, where the hell did the spirochetes come from? Where do these things start to pleomorph or change based on the environment? Because they can switch those damn genes on and off, on and off, on and off, and change and conform to what the ecology, the environment they are living in. So tonight, when you're getting those 80 million bacteria, think about this, this film itself. Oof, it's rough. Okay. Used to be an old commercial, you know, they drop two eggs in a frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. This is your mouth in biofilm. So, biofilms, you know, there's a certain level of clavicular flow, it's a dynamic, that's a healthy biofilm itself, there's always movement in there, it's all associated with the bacteria and whatever lives in that biofilm itself. You know, that's of course a magnified view of it, and we can see where biofilm here actually spreads and moves if that actually works, okay. So, it's interesting, you make a sterile environment, clean up those gums, and it's a beautiful thing. There's always going to be some bacteria left behind. So, under ideal conditions, which a lot of times in the oral cavity it is, okay, this is how quickly bacteria can replicate itself. Every 15 or 20 minutes can double over in size, okay? So, probably within 24 hours, your microflora or your biofilm in your oral cavity is totally reformed and back. But it's the nature of that biofilm, okay, which we're never going to get rid of, is really going to dictate the health and wellness on the outcomes of how that patient is going to be treated and maintained. So disruption of the um, biofilm, you know, destroys, uh, you know, changes the ecosystem. You know, the biofilm, you know, must reorganize. So the bottom line is here is that, okay, regrowth is sequential, it takes, may take days, may take hours, okay? And of course, once again, consistent bile disruption is the effective for disease control. So the point here before we take our break is very simple with periodontal disease per se. 
you always just keep the biofilm at an immature state. It all boils down to that. Keeping the biofilm at an immature state. This is why you have areas where you can't keep, the patient can't keep the particular area clean. What happens is the biofilm continually matures. As it gets older, it becomes what? Much more what? Toxic, okay? The ecology changes. It's all about ecology, all about biology, okay? So the trick is, this is why you're flossing, you're brushing, you're squirting stuff all around, is if you want to stop the periodontal disease progression, okay, and it's typical patient, you keep the biofilm at an immature state. It's as simple as that. Keep your damn teeth clean so your dentist on a regular basis, okay? Don't use fluoride in your toothpaste and keep your biofilm at an immature state itself, okay? So periodontal disease, tissue invasion. This is where we see the tissue invasion. It's a reservoir for infection, okay? And this is when we're talking about the oral systemic link. As the progression becomes, the biofilm becomes more aggressive, we get that immunologic response. Those neutrophils dump their damn enzymes out, break open that beautiful epithelial barrier, and this is where we get infiltration from the oral cavity into the rest of the system. So we know what this systemic issue, this is where, once again, the immune system's again being hijacked, dumping those enzymes, open up those epithelial barriers, which we'll talk about once again in a little while. And once again, this is where we're seeing these, uh, theoretically, from periodontal disease, all these particular issues. Remember, it's not so much the bugs that are make, creating these situations. It's their poop and pee. It's their metabolic byproducts, what's poisoning us. Okay, that's what ultimately gets us, okay? Not about the bugs creating peripheral artery disease. If you look at the commonality of here, what if, what's the big con the commonality uh, that we're seeing here? One word, inflammation. Exactly. Inflammation is what kills you. Slow but sure. Okay, chronic oxidation and inflammation created by the toxins produced in a what? A very mature toxic what? Biofilm. Okay? So don't worry about, oh, I'm eating food cholesterol. The cholesterol is getting me. That's a bunch of crap, okay? Cholesterol is a low-grade antioxidant, okay? It's the cholesterol that you see oxidizes, so like Band-Aids on the arterial wall. It's chronic inflammation in the arterial system. That's what it's all about, is this is a chronic inflammation that creates all these particular type of issues. This is where the oral systemic link, or whatever you want to call it, comes into play itself, okay? And we're seeing more and more research that it's really a situation of autoimmunity with periodontal disease. So autoimmune disease or periodontal disease, kind of interesting. Once again, mature toxic biofilm packed with all these weird things that go through pleomorphism. Once again, change based on the ecology and creating this autoimmune response itself. So, you know, once again, quick review. Biofilm, it's not plaque, okay? And biofilms aren't pathogenic. Once again, it depends on the microbe. And remember, what's also important is that every one of you have a unique microflora. You know, they call it the microbiome. Everyone is unique. It's once again that microbes are made up of what your ecosystem is, okay? It's a reflection of your ecosystem. Once again, periodontal is a microbial infection, but inflammation does the damage, okay? Periodontal inflammation uh, increases risk, we know that, and of course, the microbiology of health and disease are different, and it's changing. It's constantly changing based on your environment. Okay, so weird cases, okay? So, you know, while you look at everything, everything looks awesome, the patient comes in, beautiful, okay? tissue probing, all the things we're going to talk about in a little bit, okay? But we see progressive bone loss, and we're seeing these issues more and more today. What the hell is that all about? You know, could be a virus, could be. 
okay? One of the secret little things that are out there are fluorinated pharmaceuticals, okay? Something a friend of mine, Mike Gosswell at University of Indiana informed me of. He says, Phil, you cannot believe the amount of fluoride attached to pharmaceuticals. And we're seeing weird things for years ago. You know, we used to put implants in. I'm telling you, we used to put rusty nails in people's heads and we used to take. Okay? You know, core vents, all these type of implants. And they would do extremely old. Rarely would we lose implants. We're seeing weird things with implants. We're seeing weird things with bone loss. And you start looking at the patient's medical history. And they're taking all these different type of pharmaceuticals. And they all have fluoride attached to them. So life becomes a little more complicated with all these little subtleties that we're experiencing today. So once again, I mean, especially if you're in the biologic world, is that you really have to take the time to really listen or have the patient really list what they're taking, okay? They could be taking all kinds of pharmaceuticals, okay, and they do. I mean, how many patients come in with a bag of, like, drugs and this, like, oh, my God. And their eyes are caked over. Their skin has low turgor. I mean, they're not feeling well. Their headache, their, 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 their aches, their, their ass, their elbows hurting, everything else. And they're taking all kinds of drugs because they, they're achy. You know, then you ask them, um, okay, you're taking all these drugs. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, why? I, I don't know. I don't know why. The doctor told me I needed it. My cholesterol was a little high. What was your cholesterol? Uh, about 110. He wanted down to 101. The, the new pharmaceutical said you have to be lower. Okay, cholesterol gets so low, guess what? You get cancer. Okay. Well, um, okay, you're taking all these pharmaceuticals. Oh, yeah. How much water do you drink a day? I have a cup of coffee. No, no, how much water do you drink a day? I have a cup of coffee. Why am I headachy? Why do I feel like crap? Because you're dehydrated. And then you're turning into a toxic waste dump from all these drugs. Then the next patient will come in, Mrs. Woo Woo. Okay. Okay. All right. Now you don't. Great. Uh, do you take any pharmaceuticals? I would never touch a pharmaceutical. I would never take it. Okay. Um, you take in any herbals or um, or supplements or you know homeopathic? Oh, I take them all. Well, what do you what do you take? Uh, the list is too too far. I I, I can't even. Why don't you bring them in next time they come in? Here comes a bag of stuff. Okay, I'm taking six pounds of vitamin B. Ten pounds of this. Plus, I'm taking all these herbals. Well, why are you taking this particular herbal? This. Well, I, I thought it'd be good for me. Well, why? Uh, I think I had liver problems. Why? Okay. Uh, you're taking a lot of ginkgo, right? Yeah, you need that extraction. Oh, yeah, you'll bleed all over the damn place. Okay? So what's important today in our biologic world is find out what the hell these people are taking. Because they don't think it's important that they're taking all these herbs, all these supplements, all these homeopathics. Half the time they have no idea what the hell they're taking. Remember, herbals are medicine. They're designed for a specific reason. You don't live on herbs. It's like I take echinacea. Ooh. Immune system must be awesome. How long have you been taking that nature? Six months. You realize after two weeks, it didn't do anything for you. It boosts the immune system, then it's done. You got to lay off it and recycle it back and forth. Yeah, but I feel so much better. Okay? Understand, you know, make sure they tell you because, oh, you're only a dentist. I don't have to tell you this stuff. Yeah, until you take a tooth out and bleeding all over the damn place. Did I tell you, I, I took that ginkgo before. Yeah, great, thank you. That's after the fact. So once again, with these pharmaceuticals, these nutraceuticals, etc., you have to today spend the time because everybody's doing all kinds of stuff and they have the time they have no idea why, especially on the pharmaceutical end, let alone on the alternative or complementary end. And, you know, take the time to understand, try to understand what they're doing. So with the IMT, you know, the phases of biocompatible, uh, kind of biocompatible uh, periodontal therapy, diagnosis, treatment, maintenance, and prevention, okay? So what has been the standard of care? Typical things we've done forever in a day. Well, we look at risk assessments, things we've been talking about, what they're doing, what their history is, what their background is, 
uh, with your experience, you know, clean the teeth, you know, education, home care. Once again, home care, home care, home care. Okay. Uh, we can do microscopic analysis, which we'll talk a little bit about. Look under the microscope itself. That's a good assessment tool. Uh, we can do DNA analysis, okay? Banner testing or Han testing. That gives us another point of sense. Rinse things out, that's for sure, and use different irrigation methodologies. Root planing, scaling, the standard type of stuff. I mean, there's some discussions about what root planing is. I mean, everybody remember from dental school? You have to root plane, root plane, and the guy would come over. I, I feel a little catch right there, a little catch. Uh, I bring them back again. Okay. Oh, God. I'll never get those requirements done. Okay. Root plane scan. Supplementation. What kind of nutri you know, nutrients are we? What are they taking to supplement um, their health and wellness? Everybody loves uh, pocket reduction procedures, surgery. Okay. We don't do those really too much anymore because, you know, some of the studies have shown that all the people had those beautiful surgeries, all their damn teeth fell out. Okay. So, you know, people love surgeries and some, some don't. There's different alternatives on that. Frequent recall appointments. Yeah, you know, where did the three and six month thing come from? I mean, you know, I think it was a toothpaste thing. I heard some kind of weird story that it was toothpaste. You should use your dentist every three or six months. You know, what we do in our office, it's based on what the patient needs. Yeah, you know, three and six month thing's insane. Okay. You can have a patient, you know, you ever have a patient come in and I'm talking to him like I just saw him three months ago. And I it's been a year and everything looks beautiful. Okay? You have another patient come in three, four months, look like a disaster. What the hell's going on? They're not keeping their teeth clean. So we customize to what they need. Some people need to come in every couple of months. For maintenance, that's the way it is. Some people can come every six months. So we don't get locked into that three or six month thing. And the patient wants to stay with us and, you know, stay on the program, you know, this is what we recommend. Okay. So that three and six month thing, I, I don't really like to get locked in that too much. Laser therapy. Okay. We just uh, introduced the photon of light walk into our office. So we're combining that with ozone therapy, which is pretty, pretty interesting outcomes on that. And of course, oxygen ozone therapy, which we'll talk about, because I know that's why you all came, right? For oxygen ozone? Oh, yeah, I know that. I know. Okay. That's the cool stuff. We'll get to that as soon as I do my job here. Okay. So, diagnostics. How do we figure out what the hell's going on? First of all, once again, doing those, those health assessments, make sure you know what the hell they're taking, okay, into their system, because remember, there are no barriers in the human body. Okay. There are no barriers. Everything and moves around so whatever you take pharmaceutically etc it's going to get everywhere so you can do things like florida probe pocket probe take a stick shove it down to the gums everybody loves that treatment and figure out you know, bone loss etc you know that's always a wonderful simple thing you know the tissue tone i mean i'm talking to the you know the choir here but this is what you know we talk about here is you know once again we know what the condition of the periodontal tissue should be firm you know not bloody and pussy and purple and all the kind of stuff that we know about that once again you know we pocket you know we take a look if you look at this particular patient this is uh, drinking new jersey water so beware you know once again filter your water okay so once again we take a look at that we do our tissue tone okay bleeding upon probing okay once again uh, there are vampires out there. They're not, uh, I think we all had vampires in our office, haven't they? Okay, I'm sure we have, but they're not, remember, they don't suck blood. They suck your energy, right? That's what a vampire is, energy suckers, okay? They just suck it out of you at the end of the day. You're like, oh, my God, I love this profession. Anyhow, so a bleeding upon, you know, it's a sign, you know, no, you know, bleeding upon probing is not a sign, of course, of healthy tissue. I mean, the vascular beds are tending, tending to break down. And, uh, you know, a little stimulation takes care of that. And of course, once again, it's an inflammatory response. We talked about that, that inflammation, okay? You know, all those fluids coming in to try to dilute the poisons and toxins produced by that biofilm itself. And man, your, your breath stinks, okay? You know, you're, you're fermenting away. You know, we've all had the spirochetes are going wild, you know, and, the, you know, they must have had some horse uh, manure for lunch or something, and... Uh, you know, it's kind of funky in there, and that's a reflection of the off-gassing, all those sulfides, et cetera, that come out of those bugs itself, you know. And, of course, you know, there's dentists out there that, you know, really are into halitosis, you know. They're 
It could, a lot of it could come from the gut, you know, what they're eating. And of course, you know, any pharmaceuticals they're taking. So once again, we got to clean up that mouth because they are funky. Believe me. And some of, uh, I don't know if you say, but we've seen a, a lot of weird cancers, um, these days. And, um, you know, we've treated a number of people or assisted in their treating. And the weird commonality with all these patients that we're seeing with these squamous cell carcinomas of the tongue, the floor, and mouth, they put those damn phones in their face all day long. I don't know if it's, you know, this is just kind of our experience. I mean, we've had some amazing people, you know, that are caught in this horror show. And the one thing they always have that damn phone constantly in their face. And they have healthy lifestyles, whatever that might mean. So it's something uh, to be careful of. That's why I never have a phone on me. I said, you want to call me? Call my office or call my dear wife. She's a mom, so she always has the phone with her. Okay? So we see, you know, abfraction cases, of course, from occlusion problems, you know, fractures there. And ozone's awesome for desensitizing teeth. I mean, absolutely amazing. So, you know, does malocclusion create periodontal disease? No. It just kind of pushes it along. Just kind of torques the bone and bone's going to give way. Okay, the, the, the disease or the infective state is separate from the occlusion issues itself. Once again, and connective tissue and bone destruction, you know, we see the, uh, you know, apical migration of the connective tissue with the bone itself. And remember, when we talk about supporting teeth, and you know, it's interesting, we'll get into this a little bit, but when you think about how we've treated uh, periodontal disease, it's always from where? It's always in the pocket. Everything's in the pocket. Maybe we can transcend that thought and do something a little bit different, which we'll talk about. So we know the connective tissue, the supporting ligaments around the dentition itself all become destroyed. And that whether that's an inflammatory response or immune autoregulation or just the acidity dissolving. Because, you know, we see bone loss around the teeth and around apices of teeth and stuff like that. The bone is dissolving away. It's because it's an acidic environment. Remember, infection and inflammation is what? Very acidic. Acidic, okay? Very acid producing. And this is where we're seeing the evolving of the inorganic matrix around bone itself, okay? Very acidic process. You can do microbiologic testing itself, the phase contract mi microscope itself. This is a nice assessment tool. This is the way you kind of try to freak your patients out. You take a little sample, put it on a slide. Let me go back. I think I missed the slide here. There we go. Ah, phase contrast, okay. Once again, uh, it's cost effective to some degree. After you invest in the microscope, it's time consuming. It's great if your hygienist wants to do that. And it really, to me, it's once again an assessment tool. You take a sample of that, you put it under the microscope, and you can see all kinds of different kind of creepy crawlers uh, under the phase contrast microscope. So it's, you know, it's an advantage of chair side. It's really quick. Uh, you can see red blood cells and all kinds of spirochetes, and it motivates the patient because they go, oh, my God, this came out of my face itself. And it's relatively cheap. Why don't you spend five or 6000 bucks on a microscope, you know, from there? I mean, you know, we have it. Do we use it a lot? Not really, but, you know, it's a, it's a nice assessment tool. People have different opinions on all these different assessment tools itself, okay? Disadvantages, once again, you know, you got to learn what you're doing, of course, and the cost of the scope itself. And, you know, what you'll see is really, you know, once again, the, uh, the difference between a healthy biofilm and a disease state biofilm. We're seeing a lot of activity, a lot of spiroketal activity, a lot of uh, movement in the biofilm itself. So it's really a, a good tool, per se, uh, to teach, you know, to show your patients themselves. And it's always exciting when uh, one of the guys come uh, from uh, Oratech which give me a lot of these slides. And, you know, I remember a number of times where he would take a sample from a dentist, put it on there, and then there'd be an amoeba, okay? And it was like the excitement would spread through the entire crowd of these IO to me. Here's an amoeba, and the poor dentist with there. You know, I have a parasite mouth. Everybody's looking at him, looking at the amoeba, going, mm, naughty boy, okay? <laughs> It's an amoeba, okay? So watch out if you put a sample there. Okay. So, you know, once again, we sample. Once again, you just go down into cravicular fluid there. You take it, put a little saline on the sample itself, and, uh, you know, you don't want to put any kind of tartar itself. 
And, you know, you can look at risk factors. Once again, you look for red blood cells, spirochetes themselves, candida yeast forms, which I'll show you a few of some of them disgusting things. Trichomonas, that's always a great one. If somebody has a trichomonas, that will freak you out. Okay. And amoebas themselves. Okay. So when you think about it, I mean, when you think about dentistry, I never thought about, you know, parasites. I mean, parasites in the United States, that's impossible. Okay. Nonsense. You get parasites in all cavity. You get parasites everywhere. Okay. Think about that tonight. Okay. And red blood cells themselves. Parasites. Okay. So let's see. Typical low risk, you know, non-modal. This nice, quiet, quite biofilm. It's a beautiful thing. You don't see any spirochete activity itself. But then you have, you know, your pleomorphic, you know, another wonderful, once again, I spoke about that, changing and you get yeast infection. And you see that associated with a lot of root canal issues itself. And generally, once again, you got it in your mouth, you got it everywhere, okay? All right, you know, when you say fungus coming out of your toenails, guess what? It's just emerging. Your gut is loaded with fungus, okay? So it's not a, one of these things are a local event. They're everywhere. It's just a matter how much and, and where, okay? So you can see these different type of, uh, fungal forms in the cravicular fluid itself. You've got it in the cravicular fluid, believe me. You've got it every, everywhere, okay? So that's something you can see under the, uh, the microscope itself. And you can see the little hyphae within the, uh, the cells itself, the, uh, the fluid that you harvest out. And you can see, you know, how quickly the fungus moves around. It's very exciting to watch fungus all day. And um, that'll put you right to sleep itself. And everyone's favorite, your favorite bug, Trichomonas oralis. Okay, this is your nightmare. Okay, it's protozoan. It's a dental to Trichomonas vaginalis. Think about that one. Okay. And, you know, it could be a separate species, but, you know, once again, you got to get it everywhere. Yeah, but it's a good, you know, good, once again, marker for a very mature, once again, that concept of a mature uh, pathogenic biofilm, okay? Not all biofilms are bad, okay? Well, let's see, where's him? Oh, there he is. Look at him in the middle. Yummy. Kiss me, baby. Ooh. Oh, look at that. Oh. Look, look at the amoeba there, too. God. I'm sorry, Ryan. I put this slide up of yours. I'm sorry, Ryan. R raise your hand, Ryan. Just identify yourself. Okay, so these are kind of creepy crawlers that crawl around, but once again, believe me, it's just not there. They'll travel everywhere, and it's also a big problem. Who's dealing, you know, with, with Lyme disease today, okay? I don't even want to call it disease. I call it you know, Lyme syndrome, okay, with all the spirochetes, Ehrlichia, Bicella, you know, all those different type of forms. They're just not one place, okay? They're everywhere, everywhere. Any areas of weakened uh, structural issues within the body, these things will infiltrate and change your ecology into something that's favorable to them. And that's one part of the battle, okay? And amoeba, okay? And, you know, when I was a kid, it was always fun growing an amoeba, okay? But trying to keep it out of your mouth. And you can see, this is classic cool stuff, man. Throwing that pseudopod out there. And what's really cool is that, you know, these amoebas love to eat neutrophils. They love eating those cells. Once again, if you're seeing those white blood cells in the cravicular fluid with amoebas, that biofilm's been around for a while, okay? And those, uh, those neutrophils have either ruptured or partially dead, okay? And the amoebas are coming in to clean up house, but you really don't want to have an amoeba crawling around your face, okay? There we go. Multiple vacuoles, all the classic stuff, you know, when we're a kid looking at amoebas, okay? And they love white blood cells, mm, filet mignon of the oral cavity, okay? So, once again, another marker of mature biofilm itself. So, these are creepy things that are crawling around your head. So, that's what the microscope you can look. So, it gives an assessment of what's going on. It gives you an assessment, the kind of sense that, once again, you're getting a very thin slice of what the hell you're growing in there. Believe me, okay, we don't even understand that. But some of the things we can harvest out. Freak yourself out, freak the patient out. Maybe that is part of a good educational marker 
and uh, and maybe more specific what kind of therapeutics you ultimately want to approach it with. Uh, you can do microbiologic tests. You can do culture tests um, in combination with that. A very simple assessment tool. Once again, it's called the BANA testing. It's a very simple. Once again, you collect curricular fluid, and you place it, and you basically smear it on this card. And then, once again, you culture it for a few minutes, and you'll get a sense of the uh, toxicity associated with that pocket, okay? And this has been tested and proven out for, for a long, long period of time. Once again, I, I, I put it in the category of, an, once again, an assessment, okay? Assessment tool doesn't tell you what the hell is there, per se, but it gives you a good you an idea of uh, what the patient might need. It's a good tool to, for the patient, motivational. Once again, it's a quick test. The RID group is always the, the worst type of group, they call it, okay? All these different, more advanced biofilm itself. It is sensitive as the DNA testing. It doesn't give you the specifics of DNA testing, but it has sensitivity right up there. That's fully automatic. It's a few hundred bucks. You can get that through auratech.com, uh, and it's like six bucks a test. That's, once again, you can do that chair sign. Once again, these are things you can reinforce with the patients. Minimal, you know, once again, three species only you know, self-quantitative, the color metric, so it's an assessment, once again, really no written report. It's 400 bucks worth of equipment. Once again, it's an assessment tool. Um, okay, so it's really, you know, pretty much as effective as the DNA testing, which costs you a few hundred bucks per pop. And uh, let's see, maybe I have some slides on, you know, once again, taking a sample, you smear it on the card, okay, you don't scrub it on, it's a really enzyme system. And once again, these areas of blue show positivity, where you go from a negative, where it's zero risk, all the way up to a very positive risk. So once again, is it nail it down specifically? No, but it gives you a sense to me of more of the maturity of the biofilm that's in the patient itself. Another level of testing that the patient might be motivated by. Okay, once again, the, the theoretical degree and toxicity of the um, biofilm itself. Once again, you can see the difference here. Levels of uh, color change intensity on the, the test strip itself. It's very simple to do. You curricular the fluid, you smear it on there, you fold it over, you cook it up for a few minutes, and you pop it out, and you get your results. So it's a nice little chair side thing. And a lot of, actually, it's a lot of research behind Vanna testing also that supports uh, the outcomes on that. So it's, you know, it does have scientific validity. Once again, to me, once again, it's more assessment concept itself. You can get in specific, uh, specific DNA testing. I mean, you know, we offer it to the patient. Yeah, sometimes patients want it. I mean, we do, do we uh, do DNA testing on root canals we take out? Sometimes. Sometimes. Patients sometimes want to see what the hell they're growing. And it's still a sliver, believe me, of what the hell's growing in there. Okay? So once again, if you look at this DNA testing or the Han testing, it's very limited on the ones they're, they're testing. It's not like all of a sudden they're going to show you everything under the sun that you're growing, but very specific type of bacteria that they have DNA analysis on. Once again, the advantages, you know, it's convenient, it's easy enough to do. Uh, it has a few species in there, okay, has some guidelines, and I'll tell you about the guidelines in a second, okay, the disadvantages, you know, it costs a bunch of, you know, a bunch of dough, but some patients want it, and you know what, it's there to be had. So micro-ident, uh, hand diagnostics, um, you know, there's their number. It's I guess would be in the uh, your handouts once again. And Periopath has the same thing for you know 100 bucks or so. You can do DNA testing, and then you get a report back. You know, we have oral DNA. I think our little hangy things are oral DNA, whatever that means. Okay, and then once again, this is kind of squish it around. You're spitting a little thing, and then they give you a DNA report on you know on the different type of groups and what what you're growing. Give you a sense of once again. The intensity, the level, the maturity of the biofilm itself. Okay, great. All right. And uh, I usually use Han in a lot of tests. Very simple. Paper points right down the curricular fluid. Ship it off, and you get a report back. But the the problem I always had with this test, I always got the you know, different type of reports back per se. But the the outcome was always the same. Blast the hell out of them with antibiotics and antifungals. The same exact treatment recommendations every damn time. So what's the specificity of that? So I'm going to take amoxicillin. I'm going to take a flagell, a rest hit, 
uh, chlorhexidine, pound it into the patient, and blow their whole microflora out. Destroy their gut. Why is the gut so important anyhow? Why do I give a crap about the gut? Think about that. Why should I care about nurturing the gut? As a dentist, it's nothing to do with me. I mean, I, we just, you know, in dental school, as you well know, we're, you know, the body is nothing but something to carry your head around. Okay, nothing exists below the clavicle in dentistry. You know that. Maybe sometimes not even below the damn mandible. It just have to be inconvenient, but we got to bring drag our head around somewhere. Listen, you're all you, you've got. We're going to talk about this tomorrow in detail. How to save yourself in dentistry because we live in such a horrible, toxic environment. Where does the gut begin? Right here. Uh, we know where it ends. Okay, but it's what's in between that counts, and it starts right here. But what's important beyond it all is that if we start blasting our patients indiscriminately, we're paying the price for this now, is that we're destroying their microflora, which is critically important to develop our immune system. Where does your immune system live? In the gut. 70, 80 percent, or maybe even a little more of your immune system lives in your gut. Because remember, your GI tract is an external organ that we happen to have housed inside. Why? Because it'd be you know, pain in the ass dragging your guts around. But this is how we perceive the world in a different sense. But we'll save that for tomorrow. So we have to be very, you know, discriminant about using these antibiotics and antifungals as we can. Because we're paying the price for that now. Okay? Remember, like you saw before, that E. coli. How it replicates, replicates, replicates. So you, so you keep pounding away in these antibiotics. Okay? A few of them are going to make it. A few of those bacteria, for some reason, are resistant to that antibiotic. And all you need is a few of them to create millions of them. And this is why the age of the antibiotic is coming to a dramatic end. But there are other opportunities to save you. So you have to be more discriminant how it is. But once again, the only thing that frustrated me, I always got the same damn results. Blast them with a fungal agent, blast them with an antibiotic for weeks. It's like somebody comes in, you know, we see this with um, like bisphosphonate issues, you know, these chronic infections and stuff like that. And uh, talk to the patient, okay. Well, you're on the antibiotic, yeah. How long have you been on the antibiotic? Six months. The same antibiotic? Oh, yeah. What the hell is that doing? Destroying the patient, number one. Antibiotics work or they don't work. There's no in between. There's no in between. I never understood six months of antibiotic. And why doesn't your immune system work? Because it's been destroyed, destroyed by the, the medication. Okay. So, you know, once again, medical lifestyles, of course, uh, have an effect, systemic disease, chronic disease, cancers, Lyme disease, physical disabilities, their ability to keep their mouth clean, okay? Um, you know, what the referral base is, where they're coming to you specifically, nutritional issues, and of course, we have to do a good physical exam. You know, sometimes, you know, I don't really get into the heavy testing, but I work with physicians in an integrative group that would do all that. And we have to look, once again, when you're looking at uh, dentistry today, you know, we always love the new, the combing, you know, the CBCT. I mean, we've had one for years. And I'll tell you, it's always kind of interesting when you do a 3D comb beam, all the weird things you find. All these holes in these people's heads, like, you know, patient like this. You know, unfortunately, root canal, and you know, once again, you look at that bottom slide there. That's a root tip. So his, you know, his his unborn twin was attached to that root tip. Okay, so I mean, these are really critical things. I mean, you know, it's amazing what we see with uh, 3D cone beams today, which we never saw before. Okay, so once again, you are, you know, you grow what you are. You know, we have hydration. You know, what you eat. You know, your habits, your sleep, your supplements, your living environment, and, of course, your hygiene, your whole body hygiene itself, okay? Um, one of the worst things we ever did was, you know, those hand cleaners you see everywhere? I mean, constantly destroying your microflora, microflora, microflora with those hand cleaners. I don't know, when I was a kid, I mean, we were dirt balls. I mean, you know, we rolled in dirt, had fun now. I mean, I mean, kids, I don't know if they go out and roll in the dirt or not. I made sure my kids rolled in dirt, and uh, it's good. Dirt's good especially when you eat it. It's good for probiotics, okay? 
So, how beautiful. This is a picture right outside, uh, you know, your, your room right there, I understand. Your earlier lecture. Yeah, your room, right? Okay. So, biocompatible periodontal treatment. Well, what the hell is that about? So, treatment objectives, of course, disinfect the mouth and eliminate the periodontal, you know, periodontal or periopathic type of microorganisms. And really, once again, you're, you're eliminating, but what you're trying to do, you're trying to change the ecology. It's as simple as that. Keep that damn biofilm in an immature state, okay? We don't want to, you know, cut out all the papillas. We want to be gentle, you remember? We love the tissue. We love the bone. We want to respect all these things. So we want to get that. We want to remove the calculus, of course, all the things we typically talk about, okay? I mean, with the irritating factors, overhangs, all the kind of cool dentistry we do. And, you know, once again, make sure that the patient's lifestyle is conducive to the good oral health, whatever the hell that might mean. I'm going to control their lifestyle. You know, that's great. Once again, you know, the principal goal of periodontal treatment is to keep the biofilm at an immature state. It really boils down to that. I mean, all the research we've been doing, all the literature, all the crazy chemicals, you read the literature, you can just get buried in all the kind of should have, would have, could have. You ever read research articles? Does anybody ever take a specific stance on anything? This should be this, or it might be that, or it could, would be this. How about it is this? Not too much, you see, in the research world itself. So a period of, you know, therapy procedures, you know, we like comprehensive diagnosis, maybe microscopic analysis, different type of treatment. And once again, the treatment cycle dependent on the patient itself, okay? And we love to clean the house. This is... Uh, Dave Reggiani's uh, college dorm, right, Dave? I gave it away. I'm sorry, Dave. He won't admit to it. But, yeah, clean the house. Clean the house. Got to clean it all up itself, okay? So, you know, we can do pre-scaling rinse, you know, followed by gross scaling. Get someone kind of hunks off. Once again, this is typical New Jersey patient. And you can use an antimicrobial agent. And uh, But we use ozonated water. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than ozonated water, fresh ozonated water. Uh, there's all the things, no toxicity, no side effects, nothing. And you don't have stained and ugly teeth, but it has an incredible disinfectant properties and a low surfactant. It is a wonderful solvent. It is a solvent, universal solvent itself. Okay. And the first actual procedure that we always recommend, and what we do is what we call sulcus pathogenic reduction lavage. I think we made that name up somehow. Anyhow, so the first thing we like to do is irrigate all the pockets out. Use an irrigator. This one, this particular one's called, you know, from Auratech. Very simply, everybody has different irrigators. We only use, once again, ozonated water. And uh, and I like that irrigator because what's nice about it is that it doesn't get destroyed using ozonated water. But number two, if I can not hit the wrong button, right there, that little handle there, that's a little heating element. So it nice warms up the water just before you irrigate that. So the reason, once again, we like to, once again, irrigate all those pockets out, in my particular case, I love using ozonated water. Once again, we debulk those pockets. So once again, we try to minimize what? The spread of the bacteria and toxins in the system. Okay, we're debulking and reducing down all those toxins, oxidizing and rinsing out all those toxins in those pockets before we go there and do our mechanical work itself. So, you know, it's mechanical debridement. You know, you get in there, do all your kind of scraping and railing, and, you know, some reason, a lot of hygienists now are being trained. Root planing is out. Just getting everything's pretty much cleaned up, smoothed up a little bit. But, you know, they come to the conclusion, keep root planting, root planting. Somehow, the tooth root disappears. Why would that be? Okay. Why would that be? So, an integrated protode, you know, approach, of course, has the patient as a co-therapist. You know, the critical area is, once again, proper home care instructions, how to keep your damn mouth clean. Uh, oral hygiene instructions, you know, reinforced each visit. And, you know, once again, giving the patient the proper tools to success, you know, proxy brushes, all different type of tricks. And once again, you can do all this stuff, but if they don't do their homework, all the wonderful things we do, doesn't mean a damn thing. And once again, the patient has to keep their mouth clean, reinforcement, or send it to my wife to get tortured appropriately. Okay. So, you know, here's, you know, Paradex, you know, uh, the one thing we do love, we love uh, tooth and gum tonic, that herbal formula. That works very well for us. We use that quite a bit. Proxy brushes, all different type of, uh, what's the little brushes we call them? Uh, picksters. Yeah, and there's one called from Advance. 
But pictures are really nice. You can find them at your local CVS or online at Amazon.com. And they're great little different size proxy brushes. You know, people in there, you get know, people floss. I mean, it's like unbelievable. They're flossing like their noses. They're there, so that, you know, they're flossing everything except where they have to floss. And a lot of times, because, as the, you know, to me, as the soft tissue does shrink back with time or whatever the case may be, it's almost like a squeegee going through and they're leaving all the goop in between the teeth if there's any space in there. But with these nice proxy brushes, they get in there, it's quick, efficient, and what it does is disrupts the what? The biofilm. Okay, disrupt the biofilm. That's the key. Very simple. All these little tools, what are they doing? Disrupting the biofilm itself. Okay. In home care, irrigation. I mean, there's units that you can put on your shower. They can just blow their mouth out with that. We have little pocket irrigators. Yeah, you can put your uh, Paradex, which we don't use, uh, herbal, or even a little uh, iodine tincture, which uh, Dr. Kennedy had mentioned about using. Okay. But a lot of times we'll give our patient... Uh, you know, some ozonated water to take home or actually freeze ozonated water and they can actually take the ice cubes melt and use the ozonated water for irrigation purposes itself. Okay. So home care supplementation, you know, once again, you can do oil pulling. That's a big thing, coconut oil. In traditional Ayurvedic medicine, it's a really organic sesame seed oil. But if you want to hang around for 10, 15 minutes with the stuff in your mouth, that's cool. There's no downside to that. Uh, you can discuss, you know, vitamins and minerals, trace minerals, which I'm going to discuss tomorrow for your own health and wellness are really critical. Really critical. The concept of minerals in your system are critical. A uh, bony support, something as simple as horsetail tea. Okay. Another wonderful um, immune booster, which you should have, you guys should have every day. It's called chaga tea. Chaga tea actually comes from Maine. It's a wonderful tea that every day will really support your immune system. And you can do is like ginseng, you know, peppermint oil, chamomile tea. And you can make up poultices if you're familiar with that kind of uh, type of uh, therapeutics. Uh, malaleuca, which is tea tree oil, but you have to use them. A lot of people will take malaleuca straight and pack in the gums and burn the hell out of themselves. You got to be careful with malaleuca. Okay? It's an Australian, from Australia, it's an extract on the tea tree, and, uh, but it could be very, very potent. It has great antibacterial properties. But you have to be careful with some of these herbal formulas and extracts themselves. And anti-inflammatories, calendula is absolutely amazing. Aloe vera, you know, and turmeric, you know, wonderful turmeric every day. Ginseng is wonderful. Turmeric, you can get some fresh root, extract that out, even for your own health and wellness. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, anti-inflammatory. And, of course, an antioxidant uh, like green tea with uh, has extra fluoride in it. You know, who the hell knows? Is, is there any hope for us? I doubt it. Okay, let's go back. And of course, an anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, you know, I personally believe in the barbecue diet, but you know, that you'll live forever doing that. Well, maybe not, but you'll be happy as hell. But things like avocado, sweet potatoes, good essential oils, okay, broccoli, you know, all the kind of things, you know, you all know about it. Things that are very colorful and hopefully organic. I'm not sure what even what organic means anymore these days, to be honest with you. It's been changed around so much. But uh, good essential fatty acids are critical, good oils, okay? You know, remember, it's not the oils that, you know, put weight on. It's the carbohydrates, the sugars that do that. So coconut oil, good olive oil. And you have to be careful with olive oil because coming from like Italy and throughout Europe, it's very adulterated now. They put all kinds of weird things in those oils. So get some good California oils, etc. And, of course, once again, uh, beets, peppers, colorful vegetables. You know, typical nu nutritional stuff. I mean, you can talk to your patients about, uh, in, in general, what they eat. And xylitol is like a big deal. I don't know how much of a big deal any amount. Basically, what xylitol is, is like a sugar substitute. And the trick here, the theory behind some of the xylitol concept is that it starves the bacteria. They, they get faked out, try to eat it, and starve themselves to death. So, you know, it's a substitute, it's a bacterial reduction. Um, you know, once again, it elevates the pH. And what's the pH in an oral cavity should be? It should be alkaline, right? It should be kind of 6, 8, 7. And that is absolutely critical for multiple reasons, okay? Multiple reasons. Why? Because remember, when you start chewing food, you're producing saliva, right? In that saliva, you have what inside the saliva? Enzymes. And remember, enzymes are temperature and pH dependent, okay? You start digesting fats and sugars in your oral cavity, 
And if you're having lots of infection, the, the acidity is going to drop that pH and neutralize that uh, those enzyme systems itself. Okay. And theoretically, xylitol has plaque reduction, and it comes in multiplicity of different things. You can get xylitol, you know, chocolate, which is good, and cocoa is very good. You know, once again, the the chocolate diet is very positive for health and wellness and happiness. That's for sure, as we all know. Okay. And you know what? The old standby. Salt and salt and baking soda forever, ever in a day. I mean, you know, the salt mixed up with some baking soda and baking soda, they're both, you know, has that kind of abrasive component to get the get rid of the biofilm. But it also obviously the baking soda has a chemical effect, neutralizes the acids that it builds up. So those are the old the old reliables, baking soda and salt going back in time itself. And the bottom line, if they don't, you know, if they don't keep their mouth clean, you know, nothing else is going to work. So they all, all these tricks we're doing, all this work we put in, all the hygiene, et cetera, if patients don't do the damn homework, it's, it doesn't do us any good, and it's always your fault, okay? So subsequent appointments, once again, uh, you know, number based on, once again, the patient's response, that's dictated, uh, my dear wife will not release them until they've uh, really maintained themselves appropriately, okay, which is very good. And, you know, once again, uh, quadrant scaling is ultrasound, antimicrobial agents. And once again, you know, I talked about cleaning the house, okay, and I, I guess I'll touch on it when we talk about ozone. But, you know, you know, we're always told like the quadrant concept, but we like to clean up as much as possible and, and turn everything over, whether it's mechanical or not. But I'll show you, I'll talk to you about when I talk about our ozone and the, the treatments, we can do a lot of cool things with that okay so you know initial appointment once again uh absence of the micro microbial risk factors Oops, let me go back once again clinical signs symptoms consistent with healing you know things are looking better okay when uh, you know they're under control they're not bleeding and the tissue looks fine everything is stable then we can put them on their recall otherwise we're gonna listen once again maintenance phase whatever that means get them back you know Re-release them once again. If we think we have them under control, whatever that might mean, have them back in a month. Okay, get assessment from there, then stretch them out from there until everything. If you have a compliant patient, they're they're happy to do that. They're happy to uh, be complying with that because they're investment and they need a healthy oral cavity. That's for sure. Let me go from there. And surgery. Oh, I mean, I think there's nothing worse than a periodontal surgery. I got to tell you, it hurts like hell. We haven't done a periosurgery, I don't know how many years, and we've done really, you know, we're fine. Once again, maintaining that microflora in an immature state itself. You know, anybody ever have a periosurgery here on themselves? Good, you know better, that's for sure, okay. How many periosurgeries do you have to do to get out of dental school? Five, six, those people are all indentures today. Okay, and Lenap. Um, I was skeptical about uh, using lasers in perio, but I got to tell you, you know, uh, a dear friend of mine, Valerie Cantor, uh, turned me on to the uh, Photana Light Walker for multiple reasons. And uh, we've really incorporated that. Uh, we've used what's called pips or sweeps uh, as far as what the perio care is concerned and did a little of napping on there. But that in combination with ozone has been incredible on multiple, multiple levels. So, um, I'm more convinced on the laser end, on com combining that, integrating that in with the therapies that we do do, and we're seeing uh, some very positive, positive results. So the LENAP concept is basically using basically almost like photonic energy to strip the inside and strip the tooth and get that reattachment apparatus and get some bone regeneration. And we're actually seeing some of that. In some cases, some cases not, but we're seeing some good results. And I saw this a couple of years ago, perioscopy. Did anybody do perioscopy here? You need a third arm for that, by the way. Basically, it's a fiber optic camera that you slip down to the pocket as you're root planing and scaling. I don't even know if you can get this instrument anymore. I had one lady I knew that was actually using. She loved the thing because of all the uh, the things that were theoretically that we miss. So, perioscope, if you got, you know, 50, 60,000 bucks laying around, eh, you can go get one. All right, let's talk about uh, ozone therapy, okay, how we use it. Once again, you know, let's think out of the box in a pure biologic sense. Once again, let's keep in mind our dear friend, the epithelial cell. Okay, we love the epithelial cell, which is really our tree. So, you know, one of the things we always teach is about Pissinger's work, about the extracellular matrix itself. And, you know, when we think in typical model, 
of dentistry. We're always thinking, you know, even in medicine, in very linear fashion, the world has really changed where in the biologic world, in the biologic or integrated world, you can't think in a linear fashion. You know, it's a world is different today. People are living longer, but we're dealing with chronicity of disease. And when you see these patients coming in, a lot of them have long-term chronic diseases. So the simple you know, linear model really, really doesn't work well with that. And we know human biology, you know, is enormous webs of webs, you know, you're all interlinked. There are no separate parts. You know, when I was in anatomy school, they trained us every little dink and dent and this and that with different parts. But the reality is you are but one thing. Your body doesn't understand different parts. It understands itself as a whole thing. So once again, if things change in one spot, it changes really everywhere, okay? There's your true, true kaleidoscope itself. And biological systems are really open energetic systems. Energy flows, we are energetic beings, okay, in this physical form, but energy flows, and we're working at light speed, believe it or not. This is how enzymes work. If we didn't have enzyme systems and energy, we couldn't possibly exist. We work at a light speed itself. I'm kind of pushing through this, but once again, but what's important is the most important energetic thing you can do for a human body, any biologic system, is information. This is the key when you're doing homeopathy, herbals, all these things. This is about information. When your body stops talking to itself in an intellectual manner, meaning communicating on multiple levels in a smart way, things go awry. Remember, we love the epithelial cell, but the epithelial cell is kind of like a, a dumb kid. Unless you tell it exactly what to do, it's going to do some weird things. When bad information comes in, into the cells themselves, the cells are going to start producing weird proteins as a result of that communication coming in and produce all kinds of weird things like cancers. Okay, so information in a biologic system and your ecosystem is critical and information once again can be disrupted by the development of toxins environmental issues within your body itself and it's amazing that you know we're really think about it we're moving at light speed in a hot wet environment we're hot and we're wet big old hot water bag but how do we move at light speed how does this work so we can function at this particular level that we are so once again, you know, when biologic information is good, things function normally. When things become more toxic, your pH is dropping, you're becoming more acidic, less oxygenated, the information is just not getting to where it should be, and things start to go awry, okay? So once again, it's all about ecology. This is the basis when you think about biologic dentistry and biologic medicine. You have to get away from the mechanistic linear concepts and think biologically. What's the biologic underpinnings of what's going on with these systems to cell? And once again, we are super organisms. We're awesome. But 10% of us, once again, is this. 90% is microbes. And if you learn how to nurture those microbes, you'll maintain your health and your wellness over a long period of time. When you talk about ecosystems in the integrated world, we're really talking about multiple layers of ecosystems. And if you're into detoxification, alkalinization, all that, everything always starts in the gut. The first thing, if you go, if you're going to you have problems, you have chronic disease or whatever, you go to a good integrated practitioner, the first thing they're going to want to do, naturopath, is start working on your GI tract. Because once that starts to balance, you can excrete things, get rid of toxins, your immune system starts to upregulate, all those higher systems tend to fall in place. So if you look on the pathway to health and wellness, the first area you work on is your gut itself. Okay. So once again, you know, I know last night you're all partying, all excited about coming here. And, you know, and when you think about it, you know, how does information get to a cell? How does nutrients get there? Oxygen? And how does all the poop and pee from the cells get out? Because remember, once again, with your cells and stuff, you know, the circulatory system, the capillaries, the lymphatic system, it doesn't rub up against the cell. And all our students have been here, they know what I'm talking about. There's an interface. There's a highly intelligent interface called the extracellular matrix. Okay? And that's the ter biologic terrain. That's the interface between the vascular system, the nervous system, 
immune system and cells themselves. It's highly regulated. It's a biologic, you know, factor in the entire system itself. Every function and process in the human body involves the matrix in one way or the other. If you took everything away in the human body, except the sexual cellular matrix, you'd have a perfect outline of yourself. And that is one thing. This is the unification, the unification theory of your body. This is when you stick that needle and you stick it in somebody's face and get them numb, the little toe feels it. It's through the matrix. Highly regulated, highly autonomic itself. Once again, it's a simple diagrammatic representation of this particular area. I had a great video, but we don't have time for that. It's really, once again, this area, this interface between the cells itself and the vascular system, the immune system, the autonomic nervous system, highly controlled allowing the intelligent flow of oxygen, nutrients, et cetera, through the cells and also, once again, the metabolic byproducts or proteins and information hormones from the cells out back into the circulatory system. We talk about the autonomic nervous system. We talk about what? The parasympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system. And there's another, thing, you know, where's the second brain? And the gut, the enteric nervous system. The extracellular matrix is the fourth brain, highly regulated, intelligent area, completely controlling the flow of all this information and nutrients back and forth between the cell and circulatory system. There are no gaps in the human body. This is the classic idea of the cell membrane itself, where here's the cell membrane, which is made of what? Phospholipids. That's why we like good fats, okay? We make up our cell membranes. But we used to think about the cell membrane as this flat sheet, like, you know, any kind of cellophane. The reality is that the cell membrane itself is all these different type of portal system, the interconnectivity between the cells themselves and the matrix and the vascular system, lymphatic system, etc. itself. Where is the intelligence of a cell? Cells have intelligence. Where is the typical, you know, what does a cell think? Hmm? Well, we always used to think what? The nucleus, right? Oh, it looks like a brain. The reality, the intelligence of a cell is the cell membrane. That's where the intelligence of a cell is. Okay, and this is allows for this transfer of all this information, nutrients in, and byproducts, proteins out. That's the intelligence of a cell itself. So all these factors in, factors out. So once again, the human body is really an open energetic ecosystem itself. So when you bring all this functional life together, you have the capillary, you have the cell, the extracellular matrix, and the microbiome enveloping this whole thing also itself. Everything is synergistic. When it's all synergistic, even in your therapies, you get into alternative therapies, they have to be synergistic, moving in, in the right direction itself. So factors that influence cell joint biology, you know, all these factors here, growth factors, differentiation, hormones, cytokine, all this, how the cells contact each other. I don't have time to spend on that. But you know what? The human body is amazing. It can handle a hell of a lot of things and come back. And this is the beauty we're trying to understand. How do people heal themselves? From horrible disease, how the hell do they heal themselves? What's that process? Well, the body has an innate capacity to heal itself if given the right tools. And that's really the trick, is if you're going, you, God forbid, you get cancer, you go through alternative route, the trick is, is what factors you have to feed into the system to support the healing process and what sequence of events and how you incorporate those things are the critical as far as healing process concerned. There are tricks for learning how to do that. But we have what's called biologic elasticity. We can bounce back and it simply boils back to perio. We clean it up, give it the proper things. We can heal beautifully and maintain our beautiful dentition itself. And of course, once again, the microbes make the man. Remember now, thinking differently. We're thinking biology. We're not thinking, you know, typical dental school brain. We're thinking differently, thinking biologically, ecologically, supporting those microbes and keeping that biofilm at an immature state so it doesn't poison us. So once again, we have infection, environmentals, you know, toxins, etc. I mean, when you think about dentistry, whew, we live in some kind of ecosystem, boy, I tell you what. I think after X amount of years, every dental office should maybe be just sealed in a plastic bag and thrown somewhere with all the crap that goes on itself, okay? 
So the beauty of it, you know, our body is great. We can bounce back, but sometimes, you know, we just keep accumulating. Garbage can gets filled up more and more and more. To bleh, we spill over and go into the world of disease. But, you know, it's interesting. We look at periodontal disease in there. You think that started yesterday? No, with any disease, no. It starts much early on. By the time it becomes symptomatic or clinical manifestations, it's moved along for quite a while. There's nothing new. It's like, oh my God, I got cancer yesterday. No, you started 10, 15 years ago. I got periodontal disease yesterday. No, that started, could be years ago. Because things start at the energetic level, things shift, and then eventually manifests manifest itself through the matrix and we start to see the disease state. And this is the sequence of periodontal disease. The environment's changing, then the tissue changes, and then we eventually see that manifestation on the clinical level itself. So we're taking this toxic environment, this dysregulated environment with bad information getting in. Ecologically, we're trying to shift things, once again, to a well-balanced, aerobic, balanced environment itself, okay? Once again, using integrated biologic therapies, multiplicity of different therapies, once again, we go from a dysregulated, bad information environment to a more regulated, functional environment itself. So we can see here what's called anaerobiosis, dysregulation, and we see that typically in you know, osteonecrosis, uh, periodontal disease, we're seeing increased oxidation, and we see that in the lymphatics and the, con the congestion in the vascular system, we see that clinically and that eventually leads to ischemic diseases itself. And we see this, you know, with osteonecrosis of the jaw. You know, this is a bisphosphonate cases where we're seeing dysregulated collapse of the matrix, collapse of the tissue itself. And, you know, I've shown this many times, but this is a maxilla. This is where the patient was poisoned by bisphosphonate, Zometa. You know, had an extraction and just became amplified. Once again, how the hell do we heal this? And that's the patient healing cell. Well, we have to get the proper information and the proper nutrients into the system itself where we can get, once again, healing. So the trick is in the biologic world, thinking in terms of not just mechanically going and changing things, but think, thinking in a deeper sense, how can we support the patient's innate healing processes? Different way of, of thinking itself. So here we have dysregulated tissue. We can see the congestion, the oxidative stressors here. This is where we use ozone, detoxification, vitamin C, IVs, a multiplicity of different little techniques to allow for this uh, healing process to go forward. So once again, we're thinking in terms of how can we support the patient's innate healing process itself, integratively putting all those pieces together for healing itself. And that's uh, Tankenstein, my bulldog. And I see my bulldog is chewing on my leg here. Let's just go through quick, quick some of the ozone and then we're done, okay? So we can actually heal periodontal disease with oxygen and water, okay? So, so you know, very simple fundamental facts about ozone. Uh, it, can, it has disinfection properties, it's non-toxic wound, you know, wound healing, and improving and uh, accelerated wound healing. Because we're disinfecting it, plus we have a multiplicity, we're getting better um, um, f a blood flow, open, uh, open, uh, open uh, blood flow, and immune responses. The enzyme systems come upregulated, I'm going through this real quick. But what's important is about ozone therapy and why we like it, especially with perio or any of these issues, is that it has a wonderful modulatory effect on the immune system, which is pretty amazing. Because on the medical end, dental end, if you're highly inflamed, the inflammation is brought down by ozone. If you're under-regulating with the immune system, it actually comes up into homeostasis. It has a unique property to balance uh, the immune system and anyone's body itself. And it has, once again, increased antioxidant capacity and activation of the cell's antioxidant system to resist oxidative stresses. Once again, it has an anti-inflammatory effect. But another beautiful thing, and I know I'm speeding through this because I feel my bulldog on me here. It has increased, uh, when you inject ozone, there's a lot of cool techniques with ozone, you're actually getting an increased nitric oxide formation. Everybody see those beet commercials? If you eat beets, well, that's what they're doing. You know, it's basically increasing nitric oxide, which opens up all the vascular beds. And that's critical why we use it in, in perio. We open up all the vascular beds in the matrix using ozone. But it has a high redox potential. What the hell does that mean? It's life-giving. Life is based on the movement of what? Electrons. 
Ozone donates electrons, uh, donates electrons, so it actually recharges the batteries of epithelial cells. We know that scientifically, okay? So actually increasing cell activity by using ozone itself. And remember, we all love the ADA, and they said you need a strong oxidizing agent because it's, you know, periodontal disease and archetypical biofilm disease, okay? And you need a good strong oxidant to break up the biofilm to get to the bugs. Well, we have a wonderful oxidant without any toxicity or side effects versus chemicals, oxygen, ozone itself. And we're not going to waste time on biofilm. We talked about that. But I'll just show you some of the techniques. And it's interesting. Also, one quick note. Your immune system kills the bugs by making ozone. Your entire immune system actually makes ozone to kill the bugs. We always thought the neutrophils come along. They grab a bacteria, a macrophage, they pull it into the, the cell body itself. And then we always thought, oh, it's the lysosomes, the enzyme systems that break up the bugs. Absolutely not. Through this water catalytic pathway, the neutrophils produce ozone, punch a hole in the bug, kill it that way, and then it's the enzymes that dissolve up the bug itself. So your immune system is based on the production of ozone. So when you incorporate ozone in your system, Basically, what you're doing is just using what the body does naturally, which is pretty cool. Glad I remember that. Ozone's done a lot of issues with that. Um, once again, the beauty of ozone, we use it in all different types of form. We irrigate with ozonated water. We insufflate, meaning we actually blow gas down into the pockets themselves, which is pretty amazing in itself. Infusion, you can actually inject ozone. Saturation, we have uh, tray techniques for total arch rehabilitation and uh, prosthetic longevity. And we use ozonated oils to help support the healing process. Normal diagnostics, standard of care, I'm not going to waste time. We saw this slide already. Well, we cleaned the house again. There we are back in college. Okay. So once again, the first procedure, and once again, we rinse all the pockets, debride them themselves. Okay. There's a lot, tons of research out there. But the beauty is one particular study showed where the biofilm actually dissolves readily on the use of uh, ozonated water itself. So that was very important for us. And of course, we know that about killing bacteria. It just breaks up the membranes themselves. And these are fluorescent microscopic analysis showing cell death on the green itself, okay? So then we do our mechanical stuff. And this is where, this is the beauty of using ozone gas. Ozone gas, exposed into a biological system, instantly goes into solution and starts producing peroxides. It's the peroxides that do the work. Ozone comes and goes instantly. It's the biologic response of the body that carries the day. The beauty of this when you're producing peroxides, the peroxides actually can infiltrate into the tissue for those bugs that creep in. Number two, disinfects the pocket. But the beauty also is it desensitizes the roots that we just cleaned out. You can re totally reduce uh, post-operative sensitivity to temperature using ozone itself. It's an amazing, simple te technique. Once again, sufflation. It's just, we'll teach you on the uh, micrograms. A lot of you know using ozone already, so you understand this. And this is the ozone generator that's designed specifically for dentistry with the dental uh, handpiece itself. There it is. And it's designed where you can take that side delivery cannula, place it down into those pockets, and insufflate and disinfect those pockets themselves. And here, my working on my dear plumber, which I torture all the time. And it's very simple placing that up in there. And once again, we the beauty of it, you go up there, you insufflate the gas, you see this beautiful, instead of dark, you know, brown type of blood coming out, very well oxygenated, et cetera. You know, especially when you have periodontal condition like this. And David Kennedy taught me one thing years ago, is that you don't need much bone to hold teeth if it's not infected. And I'm telling you, it's amazing. This guy, his teeth <laughs> come shrunk all the way back, and we probably kept about 80% of his teeth, which was amazing. They look kind of wacky looking, but they're solid as a rock, and he shows up every couple of months and gets his treatment. Absolutely amazing. Even in defects like this, you can arrest those. As long as the teeth are vital, the teeth are alive, you can fix it with ozone itself, okay? But now the trick is, is just real quick before we wrap up, is that we've always, taught, always treated our perio from what? Inside the pocket. Okay, always the pocket. But there's more to the periodontium than inside the damn pocket. There's the, the, the ligaments itself, the bone itself. And with this technique, you can actually, you know, treat that. 
treat the, the peripheral tissue itself by producing the nitric oxide. So what we actually do is take with a tiny little gauge, inject some ozone in the buccal folds around the dentition. The ozone and oxygen instantly go into solution, creating those peroxides, and then infiltrate, following the vascular beds, and detoxify all the supporting tissue around the uh, teeth themselves. Because once again, we've always cleaned from here. What about all of this? So our treatment's always been in here, but what about all this stuff? This needs to be supported and maintained also because we know the bugs creep into this here also, and this is tissue that is collapsing down, the matrix collapse down from the toxicity. So by dropping a little ozone here, it goes into solution, producing nitric oxide, peroxide, that are picked up by these vascular beds and fed up into here. So now we're supporting all this structure. In addition, you can do this on the maxilla adjacent to bone, but in the mandible for the deeper bony structures, you can actually take the ozone, do like an inferior alveolar block, but it's CC or two back there, uh, be picked up, uh, picked up by the neurovascular bundler, and all the products of ozone, which we don't have time to go into, will be delivered deep into the mandible and support all the, the supporting tissue around the tooth itself. How do you like that? Yeah, I know you like that because I know you do it. And once again, what we're trying to do, I talked about the matrix. Once again, all these, ca these capillary loops collapse down under the disease state, the acidity, the, you know, the problems associated with the infection, and we reopen all those vascular beds up, once again, using ozone and the, the uh, nitric oxide effect and get things healing appropriately, changing the environment. Once again, a very slow microdose, just inject it around the tissue itself. So that's kind of the super brief, sorry about that. But also, think about, once again, biologically, refluorinating the mouth. What we do is once we clean the mouth up, we get probiotics and actually redo reimplantation around the pocket itself, getting put bacteria back down on the floor and educate our patients about the good bacteria that you take every day, good probiotics, good bacteria in the oral system. There are a number of bacteria, back to the type of oral uh, systemic, uh, like oral, oral um, probiotics that you can use. We crush them up, mix them with a little saline or water, and actually flood those pockets with them. And that's a, for another discussion on uh, probiotic spatial exclusion, et cetera. So that's another way of thinking biologically. And that was kind of the super brief. Just once again, making a little slurry after you're doing your perio, reflood that, but also educate the patient. Because if their gut is functioning well and healthy, that will certainly reflect up in the oral cavity itself. And there's a Mosinator oil. So that was it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>